So actually, when did Rotary really start? Now, the earliest account of Rotary we find goes back to ancient Greece in the year 500 BC, uh, when a luncheon club was formed by three guys named uh, Aeschylus, Socules, and Euripides. Uh, Rotarians never used their last names. Well, actually, the, uh, the Rotary Club didn't start out as a luncheon club, and frankly, it was a supper club with an early cocktail hour. In, in, in Greece, all the best people of the world knew that uh, a good thing when they saw it. Though all the wealthy men of Athens belonged to the Rotary Club back then, by their district conference, which was held at the Parthenon, was the, what was the highlight of the social season there in Greece? Oh, they danced to the best band in the land, Oedipus Rex. <laughs> Fling and flex with Oedipus Rex was his motto. And it was actually in Athens that they developed the symbol of this rotary wheel. It seemed like there was a fellow named Nick uh, came to the, to the Rotary Club meeting. He had been struck in the head by a passing chariot on the way to the uh, Rotary uh, dinner there at the Athens Motel 6. And uh, when he finally arrived at the meeting, he had kind of that run-down look. And uh, actually, the imprint of the chariot was still on his forehead. And so the old good-natured Rotarians had so much fun of kidding at Nick that they adopted the rotary wheel uh, just to preserve the memory of old Nick. And then the second rotary club was formed, as you all know, in Rome. Uh, the changeover meeting, the kick-out meeting uh, of the Rome club was uh, always considered the best meetings of the year. It was held in the Colosseum. And uh, they say it was a touching sight to watch the lions rush at the past president. <laughs> and one of the stunts uh, the, of the, uh, the birthday committee uh, of the Rome Club, uh, they always had fun on the birthday days. Uh, one occasion during the presidency of Julius Caesar, uh, they just called him Julie. Uh, the sergeant at arms, he was a guy named Brutus. Uh, he, he entered the room with a large birthday cake, and it was covered with flaming candles, because even then the average age of a Rotarian was 84. <laughs> In the excitement of singing happy birthday, dear fellows, and uh, the cake tipped over, and the candles lit some of the togas of the Rotarians sitting around the tables, and the flames spread into some of the banners hanging along the walls and the room was engulfed in flames. But President Julie, he was a man of his word, and he was always a precise fellow, and he noticed it was time for the evening program. Fortuitously, they had engaged a musical program that evening, a young violinist named Nero, and uh, he filled, uh, in spite of the flaming walls of the, uh, of the Rome Hilton, Young Nero proceeded to fiddle till seven o'clock sharp. Well, you can imagine the whole town was burned up about this, and Rotary was forced to flee to the west. Now we next found that Rotary was in France. Napoleon was a Rotarian, as you know. Number of years, Napoleon, he, uh, he belonged to the Waterloo Club. Uh, <laughs> he had the classification of past service. Well, uh, as you know, it was in France that we saw the first women in Rotary. Well, it, it didn't start out that way. We had this fellow called uh, Jack of Arc. He was a cross-dresser. <laughs> and when the Rotarians found out that Jack was really a woman named Joan, they took swift action. And they ceremoniously removed her from the Rotary Club during the club's annual barbecue. <laughs> And that legend tells us that Christopher Columbus was a Rotarian. He was the inner city chairman of the Venice Club. One day, old Chris took a boat trip to the West, and he missed four meetings in a row, and they threw him out of Rotary. <laughs> and Moses was a Rotarian, too, you know. He was the guy that created the four-way test. He took those tablets, went up there in the hills. When he came back, he had these Ten Commandments. Rotarians could never remember 10 of them. So they settled for four. And that's how we got that four-way test thing. 
And then most of you know that uh, Rotary really got started in Great Britain and you, how, how you got that, uh, that RIBI thing. Yeah. Well, it, it really wasn't an organizational structure to start out with, as most of you know. The, the Rotarians in Great Britain developed this, this slogan, Rotary is better in Britain. And as, the, and as the years passed, they just uh, used the acronym, Rotary is better in Britain. And that, that's how you got the acronym uh, R-I-B-I-B, -I -B, RIBIB. Then the Scots got into the acts. They thought you could save a penny if you dropped the last B off the name. <laughs> So finally they dropped the last word, and that's how they dropped Britain off the end, and everybody, they said, everybody knows that RI, or that Rotary is better in Great Britain, so they just said, Rotary is better in, and that's how you got that whole thing, R-I-B-I, and it's, uh, everybody knows that, of course, now. Now, you know, we had a lot of good meet, uh, leaders in the past, the Johns and the Georges and the Edwards and the, all the other great Rotarians, and... Uh, of course, you know, Bill Shakespeare was the club secretary. <laughs> he kept the attendance, attendance records for all the clubs there. Oh, I can hear him now calling the attendance record. Romeo, Romeo, where art thou? And they'd, they'd all report in whether they were there or not. And all the districts in RIBI used to have that big fair, you remember? They had this great big, big parade there at the fair. And there was competition among all the districts in RIBI. Oh, it was a great occasion. All the, the past district governors were the ones that judged the best prize. And year after year, the equestrian entry from the Inner Wheel Club in uh, Coventry won the prize year after year. Those, you know, those, those Inner Wheel girls from uh, Coventry, they, they won the prize. Uh, blue ribbon every year and uh, it was easy judging for those past governors too I tell you oh Rotary had a lot of uh, uh, in, uh, Rotary in England had a lot of these original ideas uh, they had that first uh, manual procedure oh you know, it was a big book uh, I, I think they called it the Magna Carta or something like that and uh, then they had an extension program they took Rotary to Canada and India and Australia and New Zealand and uh, well, well, they didn't call them Rotary Districts at that time, they just called them colonies. But then history show, shows us that Rotary soon got a good start in Ireland. It was just about this time that they were having the Boer War. And Ireland had some of the biggest Boers in the country. And I, I, I hear you ask, who brought Rotary to the United States? Well, the Pilgrim Fathers, no less. They had all been members of the Rotary Club in London uh, until their club president, a, a guy they called uh, Big Ben, uh, classification watchmaker. Uh, he oppressed the members with such cruel and unusual fines that they decided to start a new club over there in the New World. So the Pilgrim Fathers sneaked a copy of the ABCs of Rotary and uh, set out across the Atlantic after getting a good price on a Hertz rent -a boat well, Rotary's always been proud of our record of high attendance. I, I remember stories were told of one of the early members, a fellow by the name of Paul Revere. Paul Revere, classification lantern lighter. Uh, history shows how Paul Revere furiously rode from village to town. Well, I can tell you, he wasn't interested in any revolutionary war. He was trying to get 12 makeup meetings in one day. <laughs> And uh, then George Washington, he was, a, he was a Rotarian of great distinction. There was an old saying about George, first in war, first in peace, first to be an early labor. Yeah, old George, he was the club service chairman of the Mount Vernon Club there. George was, was chairman of the Tea Party they held there in Boston. Uh, they're part of the dis district conference, I think it was. And uh, I know the British have always been pleased that he took that leadership job, too. Well, George had a friend uh, named Betsy Ross. She made up the first rotary flag. Betsy was a 
dressmakers. She had a lot of these little scraps of paper, of uh, cloth laying around the floor, and so she started making up these little rotary banners. And then, then she sold the idea to Russell Hampton. But uh, really, all the all the finest men of the early days of uh, were in rotary. There was uh, particularly over there in uh, in the colony. Uh, ben Franklin, he was the only Rotarian that ever had the classification kite flying wholesale. And uh, John Hancock, he was the club secretary, and John Marshall, and, uh, and there was Dan Webster and Winston Churchill. Those are guys you, you could always count on a speech if the program didn't show up. Yes, all the early leaders uh, were in the U.S. were Rotarians. Well, all except one. Uh, a trader named Benedict Arnold. He was a Quanian. And uh, then Rotary expanded. And as Rotary expanded, it grew larger. Uh, I think that all of us kind of thrill at just the sound of some of the names of the great leaders of our organization. There was this fellow who uh, had the boat building classification named Noah. Uh, Noah was the guy that changed the whole classification system. Noah thought there ought to be two from each classification. And, uh, and then uh, I remember Simon Powell. Uh, he was in charge of Brotherhood Week. And uh, then they brought women into Rotary. Oh, they added so much. Uh, I remember Elizabeth Taylor. She had the classification of housekeeper. She was divorced eight times and kept the house every time. <laughs> and uh, we had Esther Lauder. She was the one that had this idea of rotary makeup. And, uh, and Scarlett O'Hara, she started that idea of ser serving uh, southern fried chicken at every rotary meal. And Margaret Thatcher, I think she had some job. Maybe it was district governor or something. And uh, Susan Boyle, remember her? She led the songs at all the conventions. <laughs> and uh, Bill Clinton's friend, Monica Lewinsky, yeah? She headed the fellowship committee. <laughs> I don't seem to remember her classification. <laughs> oh, I remember a couple other active members we had. Robin Hood and Jesse James. They were fundraisers for the Rotary Foundation. <laughs> You might recall the Robin Hood Fellows, yeah. An interesting rotary policy came out of England in the early days. Some of you still remember it. You know, the Rotary Foundation has a prohibition against uh, construction jobs. And it all started here. The Ro Rotary Foundation trustees went down there uh, uh, to uh, the Rotary Club of Stonehenge and looked at the building project. <laughs> From then on, they said, no construction grants given. One of the fascinating things about Rotary has always been our presidential themes. These are themes that have lasted through the century. Funny how some of them catch on. Even today, you see some of the great Rotary themes we have. Stay off the grass. Watch for falling rocks. Yeah. Probably the most positive, uh, most popular presidential theme was have a nice day. And, uh, or maybe honk if you love Paul Harris. <laughs> well, I think that's enough of the history of Rotary. Uh, I better save the rest of these notes to the question period, which will be held in the pub shortly after this meeting here. The whole point of these irreverent and absurd history of Rotary is that Rotarians ought to have fun. The work of Rotary is serious, but Rotarians don't have to be serious. The friendship and the fun that you have week after week in your Rotary Club meeting is some of the greatest experiences you can have. You see, Rotary was started with the whole idea of fellowship. And out of fellowship grew the idea that we can serve and build a better community and build a better world. And so our Rotary organization is really two-part, fellowship and service. You see, when Rotary took on the job of eradicating all the children of the world, that's serious business. And we were feeding children, feeding hungry people, that's serious business. And we were shipping shelter boxes and providing clean water and providing health clinics, 
That's the serious business of Rotary. It's serious business when we reach out and restore the sight to a blind person or lift a disabled person into a Rotary-sponsored wheelchair or perhaps provide them with an artificial limb. It's serious business when you restore a school and provide education to youngsters that have never had an opportunity or when we equip a hospital in a poverty area of the world. These are the things that Rotarians are doing someplace in the world every day. So let's never forget the real business that Rotary's in. We're not just in the business of meeting and eating. We're in the business of fellowship and service. And each day you come into your Rotary Club meeting, remember that it's important that you be there because there's somebody in that room that needs you. Someone in that room that's carrying a burden in their lives and their hearts and they need a pat on the back or a friendly ear or just somebody that gives them a friendly handshake. You see, that's the business of Rotary. Friendship, and we must enjoy the fun of rep fellowship around the tables each week because fellowship and fun is the companion of serious service. And every day, every hour and every moment somewhere in the world of Rotarians extending that friendly hand of friendship because they're providing service to the world. Rotary activities are like a little pebble that you drop into a lake or a stream or a river and the ripples go on and on and you never know where your, rib your rotary service, who it will touch. You never know where those pounds will go or the dollars you give. You never know where they'll go and where they'll touch. But you can know each time that each bit of effort you give in rotary is making life a little bit better for someone else.